You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Rick Bartlett. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view, how to get the plan done, and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers, How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat in the chair, hand on keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my friend Rick Partlow on the show with me. Uh, Rick is doing some amazing things in the science fiction space right now. Uh, he is uh, writing and publishing uh, like like few people I know. Um, Rick, I'm just going to tell you that you are a huge motivator to me um, as someone who has a lot of stuff on his plate, but still you know, each day tries to get his word count in. And then I look over on Facebook and Rick's like, well, 20,000 more words done. And, <laughs> and I'm like, Dang not, it, Rick. Not in okay. one day, Hank. I know, I know, I know. But <laughs> but it's just, you know, you're that ever-present force that, that I look to and, and I'm like, man, Rick's getting it done. I got to go. I got to go get it done. And, you know, it's it's good to have those friends that just do that that quiet motivation, just, you know, putting it out there. So so thank you for that. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. So um, we begin each show with the same question, as you know, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? When I was very young, I used to read a lot of comic books. I learned to read very early, thanks to my father. And I remember drawing a uh, comic strip on the side of one of my dad's old suitcases with a pen. which was an old suitcase, so he didn't care. It's like a beat-up <laughs> old cloth-covered suitcase. And that's the first time I, I had tried to write anything. Wow. What was, do you was, remember what was going through your head? I was about three at the time, so I don't really remember. <laughs> I think it was a Donald Duck comic strip, though. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, did you, um, so where did it go from there? You know, as you went through school and stuff, were you a, were you a big reader? And, and uh, I, I know you were, but what kind of stories really grabbed your attention? The first, at first, I read a lot of uh, stuff about dinosaurs. Honestly, I would go into the library and just grab these huge books on paleontology, just to look at the pictures about dinosaurs. I didn't even think to get the kids' books because I, I, I thought they looked too uh, cartoonish. I want I wanted to get like the the big, you know, thousand page paleontology texts, and and read those. Um, but when I first got into fiction, it was mostly the juvenile novels of Robert Heinlein. Yeah, yeah, I, I was a big fan of those as well. I, I still have a copy of Have Space Suit Will Travel right here on my, my shelf uh, that's right to the right of my desk. Uh, it was just such a huge influence on me. Um, uh, you know, the, and Heinlein did all sorts of stuff, you know, and, and it's famous for all kinds, but those... Uh, those juvenile novels, as he called them, were were so had such a huge impression on me. Well, everybody, I, I know more people that got into science fiction because they read those novels. Um, I read How a Space Suit Will Travel first. I checked that thing out of the library. I don't know a thousand times as a kid, <laughs> right? And I I read I reread it every year, just to remind myself of why I got into it. Yeah. Yeah, there's just something I, I don't know. I've I've talked about it before. You know, science fiction has this tendency to kind of dip in and out of of different um, uh, d d feelings or motifs or, or different things like that as time goes on. And and uh, and of course, there's different subgenres of, of science fiction, but there there seems to be this kind of overwhelming thing that happens from time to time, these waves of, of optimistic science fiction. And then there'll be, uh, you know, where, uh, all the stories that come out seem to be about all the, all of the mistakes that humanity has made in our dismal future. And, and I think that's what I loved about it was that there was an optimism to those stories. And, and, uh, you know, at, at, at the time when he, when he wrote those, you know, um, we kind of had an optimistic, you know, we were going to the moon and, and, uh, you know, the Apollo program and things like that. And so maybe that's what I miss about science fiction and the things that I really got out of those books. If I remember right, he wrote those well before Apollo. I think he wrote right. those before Mercury even. Yeah. But there, but there was a, it, it, I think stories like that helped kind of fuel that desire maybe. And Yeah. I, I think it's, I, I think it's, it's that way. I think it's almost the other way around that people like Heinlein inspired the ones who went to the moon. Exactly. 
exactly. Um, what does uh, what does science fiction mean to you when when you look for science fiction stories? Are, are you looking for something in particular, uh, or are you just do you read broadly? Kind of what what subgenre or flavor really uh, connects with you? I definitely prefer optimistic books to uh, the dystopian, you know, apocalyptic type stuff. Uh, I mean, there I, there's room for some of that, and I and I like some of it. But but my preference is for things that have a more optimistic view of the future, not not like pie in the sky. I mean, to be honest with you, some Star Trek is a little bit too too on the optimistic side because we're still humans no matter what, and we still have human nature. But I like the idea that we won't destroy ourselves, that we won't be be mired in dictatorship and tyranny forever. You know that that we'll we'll someday make it off this planet and do something bigger. Yeah. Um, where did you grow up? Central Florida. Central Florida. Do you um anywhere near uh where the launches and and things would took place? I am about uh, uh two and a half hours away from Cape Canaveral. I you can, from where I live now, you can see launches from Cape Canaveral. I. I have a very vivid memory of uh, 1986 when the uh, Challenger blew up. I was uh, working at one of my first jobs, and uh, I, we uh, went outside to watch the launch because you could see the the launch from where we were, and those big vapor cloud, you know, those big clouds from the explosion spread across the sky, and everybody knew something had gone wrong. And the weird part was they hung there in the sky for hours afterwards. I drove to lunch that, like about eleven o'clock in the morning, and they were still hanging there. It's really weird. Yeah, that oh, that's awful. I, I remember. I think I was in the tenth grade when that happened, and and we watched it live on television. I, I, it's one of those indelible memories that you'll just, if you were there, it'll always be with you. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a gut punch for a whole generation, and and then it happened again with, uh, you know, in two thousand three, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. With the, uh, I can't remember the the one that, <sighs> that burned up on reentry. Yeah, I'm drawing I, I, a blank, but that that to me felt like the the nail in the coffin for NASA. Yeah, it did. It did. Like, like when did, um. Did it really start resonating with you that that you were going to tell stories? I don't know that it really hit me that I wanted to write until I was a teenager. I mean, I wrote like short stories and stuff for school and just for fun, but I never really thought about writing a book or making you know making it a profession until I was a teenager. And um, this is back in the uh, early '80s. In the time when uh, men's adventure fiction was a big thing, right? I don't know if you remember that time, like Mac Bolan and things like yes. that. Yes. Uh, so the first book I ever wrote was a one of those men's adventure mercenary shoot 'em up type of uh, type of uh, books. Gotcha. Um, did Did you have a teacher or, or anything that? Um... Uh, that recognized that that you had this writing um, ability, or a parent, teacher, anything like that. Not really. Um, I didn't. I didn't write a lot of fiction for school. So. Gotcha. Uh, you went on to to join the army uh, after school, didn't you? Yeah, I. I um... Went to college in an ROTC scholarship, and I went into the uh, U.S. Army Infantry after I graduated. But I didn't stay in too long because this was right at the time of the post-Gulf War drawdown, and they wound up uh, telling me, well, if you want, you can get out because we really don't have room for you. (laughs) (laughs) So I got out. We got the education, and uh, that's that's awesome. Um, you you studied history, also, right? 
yes, I was. Uh, I majored in history with a emphasis in uh, early modern Europe. Early modern Europe, which uh, what... was mostly because that's what they had the teachers for there at the college I was at. <laughs> well, well, what was it about history in general that that drew you uh, in? I'd always been interested in history. Uh, I used to read a lot of, about uh, the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, classical history when I was younger. I actually took a stab at writing historical fiction when I was in college. It never really went anywhere, but I did a lot of research. Gotcha. Well, what was the what was it that brought you back around to science fiction? Around um, the time I went to college, I think it was right around that time I discovered uh, cyberpunk. Okay. I was reading, uh, you know, like William, uh, Gibson. William Gibson. Walter John Williams really got me into cyberpunk, though. Um, he had a book called Hardwired. Which I think was I remember that book. First science cyberpunk science fiction that I read. It was actually based on William Zelazny's Damnation Alley. Okay. It was like a I don't want to say a pastiche, but it was like a continuation of the the atmosphere of that book. And it really drew me in. It was something new. I mean, I loved science fiction. I loved Heinlein. I loved the the old nineteen fifties, you know, thin rocket space opera type stuff. Right. But by the time I was in college, I I kind of gotten burned out on it. And cyberpunk drew me back into the genre. So I, I read Hardwired. Um, Walter John Williams has a bunch of good books, obviously. He's a great writer, but he has three books that just drew me in. And I think really reading those three books made me want to write science fiction with Hardwired, Voice of the Whirlwind, and... Days of Atonement, three very different books, but uh, he, the, just the the world building he did in those books made me want to get back into science fiction. And after from there, I went I went I went and read William Gibson, you know, Neuromancer, Mona Lisa Overdrive, Count Zero. So uh, with cyberpunk, was it more that it uh, uh, just felt more? Um... More modern, it, it felt connected time, it felt more timely. with what, yeah, yeah, timely. That's the that's the word I'm looking for. Um, that that's awesome. Um, so it, it's it's funny that we have these things that we look back on so fondly. Um, they don't always age well, but we still have this fond, uh, you know, memory of them, and uh, and can be an entryway to to all of these other things. Um, I, I'm a huge cyberpunk fan. As well, but again, those things tend to go really dark sometimes, you know. And if you can balance, um, you know, some sort of optimism with uh, uh, with modernity, I, I think that's that's awesome. Um, what? Uh, when did you start uh, trying uh, your hand at writing those kinds of stories? I started working at uh, plotting them out and building the word world for them when I was about 18, but I didn't really get started writing them until I was in college. I was in a military history class and I was thinking about, you know, the uh, science fiction, you know, histories that I'd created, you know, cause I used to sit down and just world build and, and fill up notebooks with ideas for histories and weapons and drives and systems and all this stuff that, you know, you, you come up with. And I just had the sense that I was missing something that that it didn't seem realistic. I was missing some sort of verisimilitude with respect to how the people lived. So I was in military history class and I and I was talking to a guy I knew who was a prior enlisted marine and he was doing ROTC like me and he was a history major. And we were talking about what kind of a government could handle governing not just earth but you know, the colonies that it would that it would have if if we had a faster than light drive and interstellar travel. And we came up with a, a kind of a government and I started writing, you know, plot ideas based on on that government and the world building I'd done before. And that uh that became the first science fiction book I completed, Duty on our planet. Gotcha. Um it, when what did you do with that book when you, when you finished it? 
Well, that's an interesting story. I was at the time, this is the uh, late eighties. I didn't have a computer or word processor. Uh, they were really expensive back then. So I was writing longhand on a college ruled notebook paper in a three ring binder, really, really tiny print. <laughs> and <laughs> I had about 200 pages of that written of that book. It was called something different back then. And I took it with me when I went to infantry officers, basic course, because I would work on it when I had the time. And I came home for Christmas and left it in the nightstand drawer of my uh, bachelor officer's quarters room and a maid threw it away. Oh, no. So at the time, I was devastated. And I'm like, you know, I, I can't I can't redo that from memory. So I started working on other things. But after I got out of the Army and got married and uh, I got serious about wanting to complete something and submit it to a publisher, and I got a computer, which helped. And I sat down and tried to rewrite Duty Honor Planet. And it needed rewriting anyway because I had started writing it in the mid to late 80s. And I had had ideas about the future of the U.S. and the Soviet Union that turned out not to be the case by the 90s. So I I had to rewrite the sections of it that dealt with history because a lot of that book deals with uh, the future of U.S.-Russian relations. For those for those who've read it, they know what I mean. It's uh, it's part it's a big part of the twist of that book. So I had to rewrite it anyway, and I I got it. Uh, I think I think I did better the second time around, although it took a lot of sitting down and thinking hard to remember a lot of the things that I'd written the first time. Right. Uh, the, do you think that that redoing that story? Um, uh, do you think you learned anything from that 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 you could only have picked up from, you know, having to start back over from scratch? I learned I needed a computer. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think at that point I had been writing other things and I had grown from that process. I'm not sure just rewriting that book did it, but writing things in between losing it and then restarting it, it helped. It gave me more practice, you know? Sure. Did, did the story go in a different direction or was it still pretty much the same story on point? At the time I was a huge pantser. So I had no idea when I started that book, how it was going to end. I mean, I was, I was such a pantser that I would just start writing, have no idea. How, I wouldn't even have a, a roadmap to where the book would end. Wow. Um, well, speaking of that, what, what is your process like now? Um, if, you know, you used to be such a pantser. How, how do you start approaching a story now? Well, I wrote six books by the seat of my pants, basically, with just the barest of plot outlines. And looking back, I have no idea how I did that. <laughs> so I, I right now I write detailed chapter by chapter outlines. I, I start off with I start off with a synopsis, just the basic story and characters. And then I start doing it chapter by chapter, a sentence or two each. And then I go back in and I fill in a few more sentences. And I keep doing that. Maybe if I come up with a line of dialogue, I think she'd go in the chapter. I'll put that in there. Uh, then I'll start thinking, okay, what is this surround? What are the surroundings of this chapter? Where are they at? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? I'll put those little you know, details in the notes. And for a 80 to 100,000 word novel now, I could probably write an 8 to 10,000 word outline. Um, usually, there's some that I have not had the time to go into that kind of depth, but I usually try to get a pretty detailed outline so that when it comes time it comes time to actually sit down and write i'm not just staring at the screen thinking oh, what should i do next cuz i used to do that a lot when i was pantsing just staring at the screen for hours <laughs> yeah i think that's a pretty common uh thing that a lot of people can can uh can can uh relate to yeah we can relate to thank you I, I couldn't think of the word relate for some reason um so how long do you spend on that outline? Because you write a, a pretty detailed outline, um, and usually and it about two helps weeks. in the about two weeks. Okay, 
So when when you first start working on that, are, are you just approaching it as a as a blank slate? Like where do where do you usually begin with that outline? Is it a character? Is it a scenario? Um, what what's the genesis of that? It depends on the book because some series I have are based in a universe I've already created. Those are much easier because uh, you can um, draw on the world building you did for for the other universe. Uh, and it, there's situations that came up. For instance, uh, my series Recon it was a re- done really well for me, and I, and I enjoyed writing it. But it, it's all based on one scene in another book I wrote, because it takes place during a a war that was detailed in my book Glory Boy. And I just mentioned this uh, this operation they went on where, you know a bunch of Marines got killed and they had to retreat. And I'm like, I started thinking, well, what would happen if one of those Marines had survived and been stranded there? And that was the situation that brought up the whole series recon. And that, that can happen. Or if I, if I'm just inventing a new universe out of whole cloth, usually I'll come up with a scenario, uh, just a plot idea. And then from there, from the simple plot idea, I'll come up with characters that should fit into that and then a synopsis, and then deeper and deeper. But usually an idea, not like a whole story outline, but just a a simple idea like uh, what would happen if there are two human civilizations that uh, hate each other and are in the midst of a a Cold War, and then they have to work together. Right. So what's the difference in in outlining like that, writing a detailed outline um, that you can do in two weeks and the, the drafting stage when you're pantsing um, that, that so many people just like, it's just not there and you, you wind up staring at the screen for two hours. What, what do you think the difference is in outlining that allows the process to go so much quick, more quickly? Is it just that, that you're not putting flesh on it and you're just going for kind of high level points? Like, like, I think a lot of people that are not outliners would love to know, you know, how you get all the way through the story structure without just getting lost and and bogged down. When I did pants, I would, I would not do what some people do. I know there's a lot of people who write multiple drafts one after another. I do. I did more what uh, Dean Wesley Smith talks about uh, with the whole, I forget what he what term he used for it, but where you is it writing write, into the dark? And then when you it... get, well, that, yeah, but I'm I'm talking about like I think okay. he called it an onion method. I I don't remember, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's where, where where you write until you get to a sticking point, and then you go back and you reread what you wrote till then. Gotcha. And you start like correcting things, and let, and as you read, you come up with an idea for the next part. I used to do that when I pants. So I didn't really do multiple drafts. I did just one draft because I'd gone over it so many times writing that draft. And uh, with outlining, really, I think the outline is my first draft. And I don't write multiple drafts after that. I write the outline, which is a pretty in-depth outline, and then the draft, and then it gets proofread you know, for errors and continuity, and that's it. So I think in a sense, you know, it's easier to to write the outline as a first draft because you don't have to think about what is this character going to say in this, or how is he going to react, or you just have to to tell a bare-bones story like you're doing a police report. What happened? You know, this guy went there and he did this. And then you film, well, what did he look like? Well, he looked like this. Did he say anything you can remember? You give, you know, a few quotes that you can put in the in the chapter. So it's it's much easier to think of it that way than to try to make something that sounds good in a literary fashion the first time you go through it. It's like telling a bed- bedtime story to your kid instead of, you know, trying to write a book. You're just putting down the bare bones. I like that analogy. I like that. Um the and and then um when you're finished with that outline and you um then it's time to start drafting 
Um, do, do you feel like that just frees your mind up that because you don't have to nail down those big uh, linchpin, you know, ideas, you, you just get to go in and like, well, this is a story I've already told to my kids at bedtime. I can just go in and, and just, you know, add flesh to it. Yes, it, it makes it much easier. Um, it's a little bit, it's still a little bit sticky right at the beginning of the book because you have to come up with a hook, some way to start the book that really grabs people. So that can take a little bit, but once I'm past the the first chapter, it really seems to go a lot easier. Uh, it's really like I've already written the book, and I'm just filling in the details. Gotcha. Yeah. Which, when I, I thought at first, I resisted outlining for quite a while, for years, because I had this idea in my head that once I had told the story in the outline, I would lose interest in fleshing it out. Yeah. Well, I think we think that because we've been told that by some very prominent pantsers. Uh, I think Stephen King, you know, in his book on writing talks about, well, why would you want to rewrite the book? You've already written it. And and I think we kind of get that stuck in our head. And, and it, that may be true for him. You know, we, we surely can't speak for him. And I think his work for, speaks for itself. Um, but, but just because that's his experience doesn't mean it's going to be our experience. I, I, feel, I feel like... Um... When I write from an outline, it is I have to admit it is more like a job and less like playing in my head. You know, because pantsing, I love pantsing. I wish I could go back to it, but it takes me a year to write a book when I pants. Um I wish I had that luxury. I, I'd like to go back to it just, you know, to give it a shot to for fun because when I was writing Duty Honor Planet, specifically that series, a trilogy, Duty Honor Planet, Honor Bound, and The Line of Duty, it was a lot of fun because I surprised myself so many times by what happened. I had no idea how those books were going to end. When I started the first novel, I had no idea how the third one would end. And it surprised me a lot what happened. <laughs> Well, you know, just just because something's a job, does that mean it? Does that make it less fun or less fulfilling on an artistic level? Um, you know, can can you have both? Can you have your cake and eat it too? It's not less fulfilling. I mean, I still get satisfaction on an artistic level, no matter which way I do it. But it it is more fun to pants. I have to admit that it's more fun because it's like watching a movie rolling off your fingers. And you don't you don't know or may, actually I should say it's more accurately watching a really good TV series because every time you sit down you're writing a new episode and you don't know what's going to happen. But it, it's ve it's very time intensive, very labor intensive. I need when I'm pantsing, I needed quiet. I needed to be totally focused. When I'm writing off of a plot. I can write at work. I can write anywhere. I can write in the car. It doesn't matter. Right. Do you, do you approach short story writing the same way? I, I know you've done several short stories for anthologies and things like that. Does the same structure apply there? I have done short stories both ways. Even recently, I, I, I pant some short stories just for fun. And I find that it's 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 harder but more rewarding when I pants them. But, you know, you can't, you don't always have the time for that. Uh, I've got a short story that I had to, I had to write for a friend of mine and I had been on vacation for two weeks and hadn't had any time to write it. So I had about two weeks to get it done. And I just didn't have time to sit there and, and think about, you know, the story and write a hundred words a day, like I had done with some other ones. <laughs> you just had to get it done. So I had to sit down and come up with a plot and just let an outline. It's just like a, a book outline, except for much shorter, obviously. Right. Well, well, speaking of getting it done, um, your, your new series from Athon books, uh, that begins with wholesale slaughter. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big theme in a lot of your stories and that's, uh, you know, mechs and, uh, this idea of, uh, it, it really gives me this, this kind of, early to mid nineties, uh, video game vibe, you know, with the mech warriors <laughs> and stuff. And I love that so much. Um, what, what was the idea behind wholesale slaughter and, and what is it that you love so much about mechs? I have, uh, 
loved mechs ever since I played Mech Warrior 2 Mercenaries on my PC. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. I, I love that game. It, I felt like it was a game with a great story, and I, I always felt like they missed an opportunity to add more side quests to that game. It, it was before things like open-ended worlds were really a thing. You know, no Skyrim was just a gleam in somebody's eye. And they they ended it. They ended the story. You know, the the main story of the of the uh, MechWarrior Two Mercenaries. But they left. You could do missions over and over again, but there wasn't any theme to them. And I'm like, you know, it sucks. I want to write a mech mercenary story. And I sat down and I wrote the what became like the first chapter of Wholesale Slaughter as a, as a short story. And I and I come up with a. Uh, a few different ideas for making a series out of it, but I'd never really gotten interested enough to, to get into it. In, in the late nineties, it was like a slow time for me writing because I had uh, written, I had finished two books. I had an agent. I was trying to get them sold and they didn't get sold. So I kind of, I didn't lose interest in writing, but I lost the, the drive to finish novels. So I had quite a few unfinished novels. I had a hard drive full of maybe 12, 15, 20 chapters, you know, individual chapters or two or three chapters, 50 pages here, you know, 20,000 words. And Wholesale Slaughter was one of those. So when the time came that I had finished writing uh, other series in, in other universes, I started thinking about what, else I could do. And I I went back and looked through all those fragments of work and I found Wholesale Slaughter again. I'm like, you know, this would be a really cool novel. I just have to flesh this out. So I came up with the, the plot for the first book. And about that same time, uh, someone recommended me and Steve Boyer to each other at Athon Books. And he asked what I was working on, if it'd be anything they might be interested in. And I told him, well, I'm just starting on this uh, Wholesale Slaughter series. And I gave him the, the plot outline, and they were really interested in it. And that was the uh, beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> That's fantastic. The first book, Wholesale Slaughter, is out. Also, the second book just released uh, when we're recording this about a week ago, I think. Um, right. How many? Terminus, uh, yeah, uh, Terminus Cut is the second one. And actually, the third one, uh, Revelation Run comes out july 9th nice nice and we've got this really cool thing that uh that athon is is really kind of pioneering in this uh the small press space um this is a uh the books are uh are they um they're, they're coming out first on audible um and then following up with with ebook and in print later is that right no they come out simultaneously okay, seven, okay. Same day. gotcha gotcha um, I, I know audio is uh, is really the growth market uh, at the moment, and you know so many great audio books coming out. Um, it, does that affect the way you write, knowing that audio is is really where a lot of the dynamic stuff is happening? Do do you do you ever write with the intention that someone's going to be reading this and people will be listening to this uh, for you know for a lot of people? I honestly didn't used to, but since I started Wholesale Slaughter, I have to. <laughs> what what does that do to your process? Um, you know, knowing that this is going to be, um, you know, performed by someone. Does it? Do do you uh do you read back to yourself out loud? Like, what what does that change in your process? The main thing it changes is there's some things that work when you read them on a page that just don't when you do an audio book. Um. For instance, in Duty on Her Planet, I had a scene early on where somebody was having a nightmare. And it was one of those nightmares where the same scene repeats over and over again. So I basically took the earlier scene that he's having a nightmare of, and I put the whole thing, and then I put half of it, and then I put a quarter of it, and then I just put a couple sentences. It's, it's a repeating nightmare where he keeps going, cycling through it. And it worked in you, when, you, when you read it on, this, on a page or a ebook screen it wouldn't work at all in audio i mean it would be it would be people would think that their player was stuck yeah it, see you have you have to you have to think how 
scenes are going to play out. If you switch back and forth between multiple points of view, you have to make sure there's a breaking point that you I mean like if you're I, I've written battle scenes where I switch back and forth and I'll put like a marker, like a, a scene separation. But when you're doing an audiobook, there's no scene separation sound the guy can do. You know? <laughs> so so there has to be a clear delineation from one scene to another. And you can't jump back and forth as often. At, so it's things like that you have to think about. That is a really great point. You, you don't have the three little hashtags or, or asterisks or, or whatever to, to give the reader, you know, for them to take a pause and kind of, you know, shift gears in their brain. Um, that, that's a really great point. I, um, I, I think a lot of people will find that helpful. It, it's, it's frustrating in some <laughs> ways because I kind of like, <laughs> The idea of especially in really tense scenes where there's more than one person involved to jump POVs back and forth in little snippets like, you know, hashtag half a page of dial, half a page of uh, this POV, then jump back and then they kind of collide together like like a scene in a movie getting faster and faster right. until things collide. But you have to you have to make allowances for the fact that it's going to be an audiobook. Yeah. What's the, it's another evolution in writing, you know. It's uh, it's taking the uh, the art form to another level, and I, I guess it's good that you know we we get challenged like that to keep pushing the boundaries, you know, of the art form. Um, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us the the setup for um, for this book series. Uh, you know, who are the characters, and and what's what <coughs> will will readers get drawn into? The setup is that it's several thousand years in the future. There was a basically a galactic empire that ruled everything, but it fell in a really, really violent civil war that was brought on by them trying to create a genetic slave race. And the slaves revolted, predictably enough, but it also, the, the revolt caused a bunch of political fractures to to unravel and a bunch of different factions started fighting each other. So it's several hundred years after the fall of the empire and technology has regressed or, or kind of frozen. They've lost a lot of the know-how they used to have. They can still build some of the things the empire used to build, but they don't really know how they work. So they're they're frozen in time technologically which I make a point of that's why they have mechs because mechs as a, <clears throat> as a military weapon, they are something that we could go through as a phase in certain points in time when there's a balance, balance between offensive and defensive technologies, but they're not something that would last because that, that was the main challenge of how to write the book was the fact that I knew mechs were so cool but if you look at them, they make no sense at all tactically. They're just huge targets. So you have to have a balance of technology where the armor or defense systems in the mechs are more sophisticated than any of the weapons that could be used to, to blow them up. And that's not something that would last normally. But if you freeze the technology by having the people be part of a fallen empire, where they can't build this stuff anymore, then it artificially freezes things to where mechs stick around for a lot longer. So that's what I came up with. And there is these five political factions that split up what was left of the empire. I kind of based this all on the, the uh, post-Alexander uh, Near East. You know, the... <clears throat> so you have these, these factions that are they're constantly bickering back and forth, trying to seize territory from each other. And the bigger ones have it in their head that they want to rebuild the empire, which means constantly trying to conquer each other. And in the middle of all this, the, all this uh, confusion and anarchy, there's pirates and raiders and what's left of that genetic slave race called the Juta. They're still around and they are raiding and and pillaging and burning constantly around the borders. And the main character of the series is the son 
of the ruler of one of these kingdoms, I guess you could call them. They call them dominions in the book. And the dominion is the guardianship of Sparta. And the, the kid's name is Logan, and he is a mech pilot. And he's the heir to the throne. And he's constantly being bombarded with the idea that you have to take over someday. Uh, you have to think about how to keep Sparta safe against all these other kings, kingdoms that want to conquer her. But re what really concerns him is the fact that his people are suffering from these raiders and pirates. And he wants to find a way to stop it. And he's talked to his father about this, but nobody can come up with a way that would... Uh, be, that would work without getting the attention of all the other all, all their enemies and making them close in and stop what they're doing. So, in the first part of the first book, they find out about this legendary uh, collection of imperial technology that people have told you know stories about it for for centuries, but nobody knows where it is or even if it exists. And they find a clue to where it might be. The problem is it's on the other side of all their enemies. And they don't have like a hyperspace jump thing that could just let them, you know, bypass everybody. They have to go through these established points in space. And some of those are right in the middle of the enemy territory. So they have to come up with a cover to get them from one place to the other. And he suggests that they form a mercenary company because mercenaries are often hired by these little systems on the, the border who aren't important enough for the other people's militaries to, to come in and help them. And they hire these mercenaries to fight the raiders and pirates. <coughs> Pardon. And the title comes from the fact that they, they gave him a cover that they already had lying around of somebody named Jonathan Slaughter. And he, he says, well, then we should name the company Wholesale Slaughter. <laughs> I love the play on words uh, in the title, and uh, th there was a uh, there's more of a story uh, behind uh, the Slaughter, isn't there? Yes, I have a friend whose last name was Slaughter, and he was uh, big into uh, shooting and gun collecting, and he always wanted to open up his own gun shop. <laughs> And I suggested to him once that if you ever open up a gun shop, you should name it Wholesale Slaughter, which was a joke. Which, but, but it's I, so I, awesome. I thought, <laughs> but it was an awesome name. And I was like, there's got to be a way I can put this in a story. Yeah, that's so great. Um, one thing that I really love about this book and the series is that you, um, you really uh, have fun with some – uh, science fiction and fantasy tropes uh, that we see in a lot of stories and in science fiction and fantasy are usually, you know, pretty close cousins. Uh, and, you know, the one joke about, you know, fantasy stories is that there, there's always, you know, um, uh, uh, a prince who uh, thinks he's a pauper, you know, and, and has to come into, you know, his kingdom, you know, one day. And, um, you know, you kind of flip that trope on its head in here and you've got, you know, the air. Um, who becomes a mercenary because, you know, what a king can't do, a mercenary can. Um, is, is that something that, that you were thinking about when you wrote that? Uh, uh, like, did, do you ever think about those tropes and how you can, um, you know, do something new with it, twist on it, and uh, kind of take people by surprise? Sometimes. Uh, I don't think I was specifically thinking of the fantasy trope when I wrote this. I was thinking more of... Uh, how in military science fiction, a lot of the time, it's based on the idea of uh, government taking action. And I was, I was in this situation here with uh, wholesale slaughter, where I, I felt like there was n nothing the government could do because anytime someone tried to fight the pirates, the enemy would, their en political enemies would say, they're vulnerable, they're concentrating somewhere else, so we can go attack them, which was why the pirates existed. And so I, I was like, well, how can he get around that? What would he do? And then I came up with the idea of him posing as a mercenary. And in the book, 
they agree to let him pose as a mercenary to achieve the mission of, of getting that new technology. But for him personally, he's doing it more because it's going to allow him to fight the battles he wants to fight. Gotcha. Um, how many books are, uh, are scheduled for the series? Six. Six. Wow. I've written. I've written four of them already. I am about twenty-five thousand words into the fifth, and uh, I should have the sixth done sometime in September. God willing, and the crick don't nice, rise. Nice. Release schedule. Uh, like I know the the first two are out. The third one is coming in just a few weeks. Uh, are you going to keep that pace up? The idea is to do it once a wow. month. Um, I know that they plan on releasing book four in August. So. I mean, I, if I can get book five done soon enough so they can get it off to audio studio, Audible Studios and, and get the audio book done in time to get it released in September, then it'll it'll all keep the pace. Well, be, no, pressure, no pressure. No pressure. And, and, <laughs> and because um, you're a glutton for punishment or um, you like to keep us on the edge of our seat, you're also co-writing a new series with our buddy uh, Drew Avery, who, who's from my hometown. Um, what, uh, what are you guys working on together? We are working on, and, and it's funny because there's mercenaries and mechs involved right. in that series too, but it wasn't my idea. He came to me with this, this story. Uh, Drew had come up with a story about a mercenary unit in a post-apocalyptic America, like a hundred years in the future called Broken Arrow Mercenary Force or BAMF, which has an alternate meaning if you were, were in the military. Um, and the first one was Merchants of War, the second one Prisoners of War, and the third was Spoils of War. And he had bare, a bare outline for these books for several years, but he never had time to write them. So he came to me and said, you know, would you be interested in uh, in co-writing these books with me? And I said, well, for me, I don't know about other writers, but for me, the hardest part about writing is coming up with the outline. Once I have the outline, I can knock out, I could knock out a thousand words a day on a book in my sleep. Um, for Wholesale Slaughter, I'm doing two a day on 2,000 words a day on those because I have to get them done faster. But I told him, if you write a detailed plot outline, you know, I mean, detailed plot outline, I will promise to write a thousand words a day on this and get them out of that schedule. And we did, and uh, Merchants of War was released in April, and Prisoners of War, uh, kind of soft releases today, but it's officially releasing tomorrow. And then hopefully hopefully, uh, Spoils of War re will release in a couple of months. That is awesome. Uh, are you guys doing audio on that series? We are going to wait until we're done with all three books, because they're kind of short. They're kind of short. They're about 50, 55,000 words each. So we're going to wait until we have an omnibus collection of it and then do an audiobook of that. Because people people who buy audiobooks or use their auto, their audible credits, they want something a little bit longer, you know, so they feel like it's worth it. So I'm thinking 160, 170,000 word omnibus is probably going to be more attractive than a 50 to 55,000 word yeah, individual yeah. book. Oh, that'll be amazing. I can't wait. Um I have uh I grabbed the uh, the Kindle edition of the first one and uh, started reading it and just loved it. Um, so I can't wait to get through the whole series. That's uh, pretty exciting. It's a bit of a departure for me because everything I have written up till now has been, you know, space, military science fiction or space opera, you know, like an interstellar setting. And this is all on Earth, all in post-apocalyptic yeah. America. Which, which opens new doors, but, but it's a little little more limiting because, you know, physical space. But uh, uh, yeah, do, do you like those kind of challenges uh, where sometimes you have to change your thinking about the way you're going to approach the way the story progresses? In, in principle, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer yet. <laughs> yeah. in, 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 in the actual execution, sometimes it's hard to work my mind in and out of different uh, universes because I have to go from, you know, wholesale slaughter where they're crossing star systems in a few days to, to a uh, broken arrow mercenary force where everything happens in and around Virginia for most right, of two books. Right. 
Well, I love what you're doing, Rick. Um, the Between Broken Arrow, Mercenary Force, and Wholesale Slaughter, you've just got amazing stuff coming out. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to connect with you and all of that good stuff, um, where can they find you online? My Facebook uh, author page is facebook.com backslash duty on our planet. I also have uh, a website, rickpartlow.com. And of course, my Amazon author page under Rick Partlow. There's only uh, there's only two Rick Partlows on Amazon, and one of them is a screen is a screenwriter slash uh, Dolby artist and character actor. So you can probably tell us apart. We're gonna put links to all your stuff in the show notes uh, and send everybody to see you, uh, Rick. It's been so much fun uh, chatting and catching up. Uh, we wish you much success on the on all the series that you're doing. Um, be sure to come back and come and and uh, catch us up when the series ends. Will do. Thanks for having me on, Hank. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I'm melting! I'm melting! cried Joey. Take the picture already! He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue. Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised and trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, Yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy. And her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowder, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man. Say chowder. Fine, chowder. Joey got the shot, and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom. <laughs>